Hello, welcome to color video. I'm going to cover the most important, the crucial fundamentals in the color and what should we do in order to organize our understanding, our analysis and our choice of pigments. So let's begin. Each painting we do, each picture we are creating is an uh, arrangement, an arrangement of uh, shapes of colors. And this is very important concept I would like you to focus on. So we deal with two dimensional surface. We deal with something which is flat by definition. So we apply uh, shapes of colors on the flat surface of our canvas or our panel. And the best way to begin is to try to, to squint and to see the, our setup, our, our model or our reference as uh, in, in the same way as just a puzzle or just a mosaic of flat shapes. And each shape has four characteristics. First is the actual shape. The, the design of it, the drawing. So first is the shape. The second one is value. How dark or how light relatively this shape is. This, the third is the color. And the last one is the edge. And today we are going to talk about this, about color, but Color is always connected to value. So in every of these paintings, which we have here, uh, no matter how sophisticated or simplified design is, how many light sources we have, like two light sources here, two light sources here, two light sources in this case, but one, 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 one light source in this case, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter how finished the painting is and how uh, detailed the background is. We deal, every time we deal with a, just the shapes of colors. And the best way to approach is to start with a, with a simplified basic colors. The, general colors, colors which we see in big shapes when we squint. So begin, to begin with just a simplified shapes is always the best way. Like in this Rubens sketch here, as you can see, he didn't even bother himself with the value structure. Just, just a general, general separation of light and dark families, but no more. Most, mostly, the concern here, the focus here, is just the design of these shapes with the different colors, and we immediately can see the blue, red, and yellow, yellow color shapes. The same is here. Just the beginning of it very very simplified and very general shape of color helps to establish the most important relationships between between the shapes in, in the painting the same is here and the the, folk, the, uh, the important part is in all of these cases even even this even this watercolor by sergeant we can consider as the same approach just squinting and building the illusion with very, very general big shapes of colors and values. So uh, when you when you apply such uh, when when you apply these first initial shapes of colors, try to do it thinly. In, in this case, you will be able to to apply the next layers, more sophisticated layers of colors. Like here, so we start with very general, with very broad and simplified color shapes, and moving on, 
building more and more color relationships, adding adding different colors and small shapes, uh, describing the form or describing the surface or ad, ad, adding more information into the local color or into the texture and whatnot. So the point is to move from very general to specific all the time. Regardless of painting style, uh, all of these painters, they, they use the same principle. Every, every time is just an arrangement of shapes. So you can, you can work very precisely, you, you can build your shapes, you can design your shapes uh, with very, uh, I would say, precise edges and with a very thorough design, or you can go uh, and just work in a very expressive way using a broad, uh, like thick brush strokes, palette knife, and so on. Uh, it can it can be very fluid. It can be it, it, it can it can be like this. Doesn't really matter. The most important is just a, every time we have to deal with this with the arrangement of the of the shapes of color. Also, I, I would say I would say every time you work, try to focus on the simplified picture which you can see when you squint, and only later you open your eyes and uh, try to to make it more and more sophisticated. So it's why from the distance we we can see still the arrangement of all all of these shapes. It works. And the same goes for the for the photo references or for setup. So I recommend you to to force yourself, not to force, okay, just to train yourself to see everything just as an arrangement of shapes, like this stained glass here. It's just the the, the same stencil type pattern. The colors, 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 and the shape, like for example, the, 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 this situation here, we have purple, yellow, another purple, violet, orange, orange, dark, mm, dark brown. So if if we if we simplify it this way, it helps us to to focus on the on the general colors first without diving too deep into details too early so this is the most important thing to master if you want if you want to be successful especially if you want to be successful in in alla prima painting so like like the, this with the waterfall we definitely can say that we have almost a chromatic situation with the background just we can we could even say like i don't know dark green and light yellow and here we just have uh, or we can say this is a blue primary uh, and we can say we have just two yellow dots there creating creating accent and establishing the composition or or this one we have bunch of shapes but we can just say that we have green and red shapes in the skin tones and we have black and yellow shapes in the background helps a lot so i recommend you to focus uh, on to practice to practice such way of thinking uh, take your favorite old master or take your current reference you are working on and just try to to break it down to very simplified shapes of colors but each color should be defined so ideally i recommend you to do it even verbally because verbalization is a very powerful tool if you say aloud which color do you see and how you perceive it it will help you later on the palette to mix it and we are going to talk about it right now the, the colors and 
how they are connected with values. So you see, I, I've just simplified like this still life setup here to see that uh, in pictures I have like just red shape, yellow shape, yellow orange shape, red shape, green shape, and the flowers are just three three big shapes: the shadow, the mid tone, and the light. So I have something like that. And it helps a lot to start to start planning or to start painting. Because sometimes all we all we need to do is just to fill the empty canvas, to, st to start to fill it with the, with the colors and to figure out the smaller relationships and small details later. So the the most important especially for fig figurative and for portraiture is not exact copy of the colors not the matching of the colors which is also which is also important and quite um, crucial task i would say but to, today today i would like to talk about how we can use color with value in order to create an illusion of three dimensional object or just illusion of the form so if we, if we look at this reference we we can we can just talk now about the main main components of the illusion so in the lights in the light group of values we have lighter half tones i i call them light these ones we have highlights which are just reflections of the light source. So if if you if you keep in mind that the highlight is a reflection of the light source, it will also it will also be helpful in in order to to show to show the actual color of the light. Uh, we have cast shadows, sharp edges, the shadow which is ca casting casting from the object to another object. We have core shadow, we call it terminator sometimes. So in some sources it can be called terminator line. And this is the, the, the area where the light ends and the shadow begins. It should be, it should be darker than general shadow. So we have general shadow here. And yes, we have a mid-tone. And mid-tone is the, the most chromatic part of our object. So the most, the, the most chromatic, the most saturated part will be here in the mid-tone. Because the light itself is replacing the local color and making, making it look more like light source. So it is, make, it is, it is changing the color of the surface towards the color of the light source. So if let's say we have if let's say we have uh, bluish light, cool light, it will make the half tones in the light paler. Uh, so we will need to use cooler pigments. We will need to add cooler pigments to, to our general skin tone mixture to, to make it believable, to make it not just lighter but also cooler. So consider consider the mid-tone like like this one and consider mid tones to to provide the maximum of color information so mostly saturated and if we look into the shadow in general and yes uh, let, let, let me finish with um, with definition so we have occlusion occlusion shadows are happening in the areas where one object is touching other object in the area of contact between between two two different objects or parts of the object so no reflected light nor the general light the main light reaching reaching these areas it's why it is that are so dark we have reflected light also another very important concept reflected light Normally, I, I would say normally, not often, not, not, not all the time, but very often, reflected light is warmer <clears throat> than the general light, when the, than the main light. So 
I, I would say it is very safe to, to consider the shadow and reflected light in situation when we, when we work indoors to consider it just a warm light, a warm color. And if you notice, if you noticed already, the shadow here in this reference is very flat. So it provides minimum of color information and minimum of visual information comparing to the lights. So in this area, in the half tone area, we have maximum of the color and we have maximum of visual information. So texture, uh, different, different local colors, greenish, bluish, reddish, uh, what not. We, we see them mostly in these areas. In the shadow, we have very few information. In the lights, also not so many. So this is absolutely important. So try to try to keep it this way in the painting. So I recommend to deliberately make shadows look more flat and provide less information and provide less less saturation, less information about the color and less information about the, um, the texture and so on. So the reflected light, as I say, is warmer. And this is generally all about, about the singular light source situation. Let's move on. Now we have, okay, I just remove it. Now we have the situation with the two light sources. We have outdoor situation. Every time you work outdoors or you paint, you paint something, your setup is situated outdoors, consider two light sources. Because you have, uh, like in this case, we have um, one light source is the sky, uh, is the sun, and the light is coming this way, so it is casting the sharp shadows. It, it is the spotlight, very powerful spotlight. And the secondary light source is the sky, the blue light coming from above, very diffused. So it is not casting the shadows, very, very soft ones. But it is feeling the cast shadows here. So now the occlusion is more important than in previous in the previous situation. So occlusion is the area where where there is no light, not from the sky nor from the from the sun. It is why it is so dark and relatively warm. But the cast shadow is not uh, uh, is not solid anymore. The, the cast shadow is changing its color because of the fill light of the sky. So every time when you work outside or you, you are creating portrait which is, which is supposed to be outdoor portrait or painting the figure outdoors, whatever, think about the planes in the shadows which are perpendicular or just facing, facing the secondary light source, the sky in this case. So now we can see that here in the shadow we will have cooler, cooler version of the shadow. We will have neutral warm part of the shadow and we have even warmer reflected light. So the, the shadow outdoors or shadow with the two light sources are going to be more complicated than with a singular light source. It is why I recommend to work, to practice first one light source and only after move to the to outdoor or to towards using two light sources in, in paintings. Mm, to conclude this, uh, this slide, I will say that even, even looking at the stones, we can say that the mid-tone area is 
providing maximal information about the color and the, the surface itself. So the light here is less col colorful and definitely it is uh, with a less information, with a less visual information. Uh, we need to, I believe we need to use these principles, sometimes even, even force them, sometimes even uh, uh, exaggerate them in order to create believable illusion. And we can have a look at other examples like this one. So, so here in, with, with the eggs, uh, with, with eggs, uh, you can see how different surfaces can reflect different reflected light, like more orange here, very very warm, or very warm there, and it is getting more neutral, even cool here when we deal with a with a white surface, and you can see that sometimes, sometimes. When surface is very reflective, when it is flat reflective white surface, the reflected light can can be quite powerful, and it can confuse you, especially on the photos, because remember that photo photo camera uh, is distorting the values a little bit. Uh, so when you paint from life, you can also see it. Uh, those who are painting, who who've done the painting of the casts they know that the reflected light in the cast can be very deceiving. So my recommendation is to force it a little bit to make, to make reflected light look slightly darker. It will just increase the illusion of the form without, without violating it. But Sometimes, uh, let's say, when you deal when when you have white shirt in portraiture, or a really really white reflective background or surroundings, you, know, you can you can try you can try to consider the reflected light as powerful as the secondary light source, and try to build the illusion as you see it. But notice how powerful the three dimensional illusion is here or even with this egg but these two they look slightly more flat because especially this one because of the really strong reflected light with uh, with skin tones we deal mostly with with such situations here because and, and e e even more because skin is not incredibly reflective it is, uh, it is a, I would say it is uh, semi-transparent, uh, it has translucency, so the light comes through the skin and it is not reflected thoroughly from the skin. Okay, let's have a look at these examples. So, notice how the edge of the shadow, so the, the we, we have, again, we have the core shadow here in the lemons and we have a mid-tone and this mid-tone is, again, m way more colorful than the lights and then the shadow. The same with this, with the peers here, you see, uh, we, we, we can sense quite powerful greens in the mid-tones areas. In the mid-tone areas, but the lights are paler, and the shadows are also less less colorful. It it doesn't work all the time this way, but in most of the cases, I would say in most of the cases it works this way. So um, try to mix your lights, not just different temper temperature, which which is already which is already really important. But try to also create your lights slightly paler than the mid-tones. It, 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 it will help with, uh, with the such illusion. Even uh, this slide shows that even with a filtered light or with a colored light, when we, we deal with, a, with artificial light, 
the principle stays the same. So the the half tones, the half tones, they are more chromatic than the lights, and the reflected light is more is warmer. Is making shadows warmer. So I will I will say this this mixture this color in the light so you see that the the light source is i would say maybe yellow or orange so it makes everything looks quite monochromatic but still we have a lot of visual and color information in in the transitional tone in the mid tone area and the shadow again, the shadow looks very, very empty. So this is this is very important. Try to maintain emptiness in the shadows and focus on bringing as much informa information as possible into the mid-tones and the lights. And we can see this principle also in master's work. Like <coughs> in, in this part, of it, the shadow is quite flat, almost no information, both in, in the hair, in the skin, and in the costume. But the skin tones in the light, they provide, again, we have mid-tone, area, these ones, reds, oranges, many color information, many, many a, a lot of physical paint and uh, the light section, uh, the half tones in the light and the highlights, they are less colorful so something like this you see the same is here in the sergeant portrait we have quite flat shadows and more sophisticated lights more sophisticated mid-tones here in in this area we have we have this uh situation when the white surface reflects quite powerful light creating illusion of the secondary light source so uh, it is it is a little bit advanced so I will suggest just to to do it this way in the beginning just to keep it to keep it more straightforward okay now we are going to talk about the color and how to analyze each color which which we which we need to mix so every color uh, first question we should ask ourselves ourselves is which hue is it so hue and we we can uh, using color wheel we can just uh, navigate it to, to find the hue, or we can just do it uh, logically. So let's say you have, uh, you see the yellow, and you ask yourself, okay, which, uh, which type of yellow, which, uh, is, it, is, it, is it yellow like this? The cool looking yellow or it is yellow like that warm yellow or it is maybe even like this extremely warm yellow and asking yourself this question you can quickly narrow the the placement on the color wheel for for this primary because we deal let, let, let me let me do it this way we deal with a three primaries mm, okay maybe maybe like that so we have blue primary we have red primary and we have yellow primary 
and each color we, we see is going to be part of, of this primary. So we, we definitely, it, it should be either red or yellow or blue. It cannot be, it cannot be both. So if, let's say, you see the yellow, you can first start with, with this, with the placement on the, on the color wheel, which means cooler yellow, warmer yellow, or like extremely warm yellow, like orange. The same for the reds. And, and as you can see, you, you, already have this, uh, you already have this document uh, about the pigments. As you can see, I've placed the, my normal, my most used pigments here on the color wheel, which helps me to just to imagine the color and imagine the mixture, imagine, uh, think, to think about which pigment I need to mix this color. So let's say I see something like that. I see saturated yellow, warm yellow, mid-tone. So I could say probably it, it is going to be my cadmium yellow or maybe it cadmium yellow plus yellow brown or just yellow brown. Or it can be, or if the yellow which I see is, is very lemon looking yellow, I will just go with the Latin yellow or cadmium yellow lemon. So if you, if you think about each color, each hue this way, cooler, warmer, neutral, it will help to, to find out which exact, exact pigment you need to mix it. So the second question is, high dark or light this color so for example if i if i see like like the like the shadows here like like this shadow here in, in in this slide i could say this is a red primary this is a quite dark red primary and also it is not so saturated so like desaturated red primary probably it is just a burnt amber because burnt amber is the less chromatic dark red which we have in, in this situation. Or maybe I should just mix it. And to mix, to mix such red, I need to, to use, probably I will need to use a lizarding crimson and raw amber mm, just to combine them together to have, to have this effect. Or I can say, I will take transparent red oxide, which is going to be a really, really powerful orange like this, and mix it with ultramarine blue to have to have this uh, to have this effect, to have this result. So, question number one is which hue, and we just go logically asking ourselves like blue. Blue can be like this almost almost violet or it can be like that almost green so viridian is good example of uh, such such blue primary which is going to be very green so first question is hue the second question is how dark it is it also can help uh, if if your color is very dark you can go and look for dark pigments already Raw amber as a really dark desaturated yellow, burnt amber, a lizarding crimson, ultramarine blue, ivory black, viridian, all of them and many others, they are they are just darker than, than the rest. So you can rely on them if the if the value of the color you are looking for is is dark and vice versa. If if you need high value, light value you you look for solution you look for the pigments in in the lightest in the lightest among the lightest pigments on your palette and the third question is chroma how strong the color is because color can be saturated maybe desaturated and asking yourself these three questions 
you can you can just narrow down the procedure and you can mix it so i recommend you to think about the your palette think about your pigments and look at each pigment and ask yourself why do you have it and how it is going to help you uh, to solve to solve a particular problem so for example you can take any reference or you can take master painting and you can try to analyze the shapes of colors and the mixtures you need to mix and which pigment which pigments are you going to use for each shape so to simplify it i could say we have we have let's say the, the this this types of shapes maybe maybe the shadow will be like this so the background first i i want to analyze the background so the background is dark obviously it is dark but it is also warm so i will say it is a red primary it is a red primary desaturated so low chroma dark value warm red so all three questions are answered and i can quickly just build it this way what about the hair then the most uh, the darkest the darkest shape in, in in this example what about it i would say the hair is um, yes i would say it's blue primary it's a blue primary so like ivory black straight from the tube dark desaturated blue primary the shadow in the in the coat is i i would say i would say it is uh, again it is i, I would say it is yellow primary very dark desaturated cool yellow mm, not not even like this like that colder yellow primary and but transitional half tone will be more colorful here the mid tone so I, I will just use the green here in this area what about the light of of the coat i definitely see it as as yellow primary quite light in value but also desaturated so the chroma is very low but you see I, i'm not using blue primary for for it I, def I i'm sure i'm sure that it is yellow primary so i i just make it make it this way the shadow here something like that the two two blue mixtures for the two blue mixtures here one is darker warmer for the shadow and one is slightly lighter and more saturated for the light something like that and finally i just go into skin tones and i could say that the shadow in the in the skin tones a red primary kind of a brown shadow the eyes the same as hair the half tones mid tones again they are most chromatic a lot of reds or so, something like this and finally the the light the lights in the skin they're just yellow primary in this case so some, something like that quick understanding quick quick breaking down the the values oh sorry the colors of this uh, example and when you do it you can do uh, you can do it digitally if if you prefer just to to train yourself how to um, to test your ability to 
to verbalize and to describe it to yourself just to to follow the this logic you can do it with uh with actual paint on the canvas which which we are going to do next week and also you can just do it verbally just analyze it and say it aloud to yourself what do you see which colors do you see how can you simplify it to the very in the, in the very beginning how to make it how you can just describe it as a plan of mixing a plan of mixtures so my uh, exercise I would like you to do is just to take your references your favorite masters or your your setup which you're working on and try to decide which pigments on the palette you need to mix the general colors which you see when you squint and why so you can send me your your results your your combination of pigments and i will give you my feedback on that so this is more or less everything i wanted to discuss today my main advice is to focus on very simple approach like i've just described ask yourself these questions which color which hue which value the which uh, chroma and just build it as an arrangement of of the flat shapes so some, something like that this will help to to analyze all the colors and values immediately without over, overthinking them but also it is a very powerful tool if you keep in mind the principles which i've just discussed about the reflected light about the different temperatures about how environment can affect the color of the shadow and how generally shadows appear warmer than the lights due to the qualities of reflected light and next in the in the next uh, lesson i will show some exercises on the palette on the canvas and also i will explain two light source situations and how we can perceive the color in context so stay tuned and thank you so much for watching happy painting